All right, folks. Hey, Dr. Baker here. Got a couple steaks for my lunch today. Now, as you guys see, there are basically no carbohydrates on this meal, and that's pretty much my diet for the most part. Now, a lot of people will say that there's a problem with that, and that because you don't consume carbohydrates, you're going to have uh, a, an upregulation, significant upregulation, the amount of gluconeogenesis that's occurring. That is to say that making glucose from alternative sources such as things like fats, proteins, or perhaps lactate. And while certainly gluconeogenesis is occurring, diet doesn't really have much of an impact on that. For those people that say, oh, gluconeogenesis is very stressful on the body and so on and so forth, and we should minimize that, and that's why we want to consume lots of carbs and sugars and so on and so forth. This is some of the uh, sort of the uh, uh, philosophy coming out of the roost. So those are probably involved in sort of things like the Ray Peat uh, sort of camp. The reality is, is that diet really has very little impact on gluconeogenesis. So this paper here showed that, you know, varying diet carbohydrate concentration from as low as 2% up to 70% had basically minimal impact on the rate of gluconeogenesis. That is to say that there is significant gluconeogenesis going on in your body at all times, regardless of what diet you eat. And so the concerns over stressing the body out and, and forcing gluconeogenesis by lack of carbohydrates is basically not founded. It's basically just sort of this sort of talking point without real substance behind it. The reality is, is that gluconeogenesis is occurring whether you want, want it or not, regardless of your body, uh, your body's diet uh, or your habitual diet. So that is not a valid criticism of a carnivorous diet or a low carb diet or a ketogenic diet in my, in my view. Anyway, I'm gonna enjoy this steak. Uh, these are two steaks. One came from uh, Farm Fresh Northwest up here in Western Washington. This is this T-bone or the actually porterhouse. The difference between a T-bone and porterhouse is basically the filet side, depending on how big it is. If it's over two or three inches, then it's considered a porterhouse. If it's smaller than that, it's considered a T-bone. And then of course this wonderful um, New York strip that I've got from Better Fed Beef. And so I look forward to eating these. You guys take care.